Hello, everyone. I'm Vicky, and welcome to our new episode of WPF Tutorial Videos. Not long ago, we received a request from a viewer asking us to help modify a Trivu interview test product since it was not convenient to directly modify the code. So we temporarily built and provided a condensed version of the Trivia sample that includes the main structure and functionality. We hope this project will help him better understand the construction and principles of Trivia. Considering that this project itself is a very good material, we decided to optimize and improve it based on the original version and share this excellent project with everyone. Trivia is widely used across various platforms. If not customized, its usage can be quite limited, but it is highly flexible when it comes to customization. Although, Tribute is one of the more challenging controls to customize in WPF, but once completed, its value is immense, and it can be applied in many scenarios. However, redefining a Tribute from scratch in the actual project can be quite complex and burdensome. Therefore, in this video, we will provide a very comprehensive and detailed explanation of the entire Tribute control programming process, helping you grasp the logic and techniques behind building this powerful control. And I have uploaded the source code of this project to GitHub, so when you're browsing and downloading, don't forget to click the star and fork. We will continue to update more high-quality WPF and other cross-platform techniques tutorials in the future, so don't forget to subscribe our channel. Okay, now let's get started. This time, we will start from scratch again. So first, let's create a new project. We select the WPF application and name the project Demo Lab. We choose version 8.0. Since we are going to redefine this application, so we first delay the automatically generated AppDesamel, Assembly Info, and Main Window. OK, first, we need an application. So we create a new class and call it App. This app, of course, inherits from application. When application starts, it needs to display a window. So we need to override the onStartup method in the application class and prepare the window that will run as a main window. Since we haven't created a window yet, so let's first generate a window for testing. To make it easily identifiable, we can also add a title. Then call the show dialog method to display this window. All right, the logic for the application instance and main window is ready. Next, we need to create the entry point of the program. Generally, we name it program or starter. Here, I prefer the name starter. Here, we should know this class will not be used as an instance. It only serves at the entry point of the program. In the class, we create a method with STA thread attribute. It is a static void main method. Note that the STA thread attribute must be specified because it indicates to the corresponding method that it is the enter point of the program. Since we are not using AppDesamo, so the attribute must be declared. Also, the method name must be main, otherwise it will cause an error. However, the string argument's parameter can be omitted, as it's not too sure for the content of this video, so feel free to choose. Okay, next, create an application instance and call its run method to start the application. This way, the onStartup method we prepared in the app instance will be called, and the main window will naturally be displayed. Okay, great. We have now prepared the basic startup structure of WPF application, as well as the creation of application instance and the running of the main window. So next, we will no longer use a temporarily created window, but we will create Cupertino window control based on custom control. We won't create this file within the WPF application. Instead, we will create a new project. Cupertino forms, and then specifically create this Cupertino custom control within that forms project. Actually, there are many reasons why we don't directly create a Cupertino window within the WPF application. Here are a few simple explains. First, the core of our construction is a window. So by managing it separately from WPF application project, we can focus on handling the basic aspect of the application instance. This way, we can spare it out the functionality like WPF layout, resources, and the model across different projects. This kind of a project modularization is a fundamental aspect of WPF project architecture. 
In the previous tutorial, we were gradually familiarized ourselves with this WPF architecture design process. We've been continuously separating the project, removing the basic elements from WPF application, and reorganizing and managing them. By using custom control, we achieve modularization and resource distribution. Now we'll use this modular approach to create the Cupertino window. And we will modularize its control elements to complete this Cupertino style tree view. All right, let's create a new project. This time we will use the WPF custom control library. We'll name the project Cupertino Forms. Again, we will delete the automatically generated files. Next, we'll create a set of new folders to manage this Cupertino window. Then we will create a new window using the WPF custom control method. And we will call it Cupertino window. Now we can see with the creation of this project, the system automatically generates the necessary assembly info and generic files. Since this is a window, it naturally needs to inherit from the window class. Okay, next we need to create the corresponding resource. First, let's create a views folder under the same directory. Then we can use the style from generic project. Copy it and rename it to Cupertino window. Now let's go to the project and remove the unnecessary using statements and replace the namespace with views. This way we can use this namespace. Also, we need to replace a local with views. Then let's go to generic file, delay the automatically generated style, and remove the unused using statements. In the resource dictionary, we'll use a merge the dictionary to combine the projects. You will add the Cupertino window addresses to the source. Then let's press F12 to confirm. No issue here. Let's confirm again. And it looks good. All right, let's first add a slider for testing purpose. Now we can replace the X setting window in the application with our Cupertino window. Before doing that, we need to add the project reference. Replace it here. Let's run it. The slider is displayed, right? Since the background is currently no, it's showing up as black. We can initialize the background in the window to say its original appearance. We we'll set a low transparency property to true and the window style to no. Let's take a look. The window is displayed, but there's really nothing except the slider, right? If we don't set these properties, the window will appear without a background color. So it defaults to black. So that is logic here. In this project, we'll set the background color to white. Okay, at this point, the window setup is complete. Next, to create data in the tree view, we need a view model. This is also the first time we're using the MVV model in our videos. So let's go ahead and build it. Okay, first, let's create a set of folders to manage our view models. We'll create a new class and call it Cupertino Window View Model. And this part needs to be public since it will be used for binding. Okay, let's test it first. We'll temporarily create a name property and assign a view for it. Then in the Cupertino window, we'll set a data context to connect our view model. Next, we'll delete the slider and replace it with a test block, binding it to the name property and setting the font size to 30. Let's run it.
Okay, the name is displayed, right? This means our view model is successful connected. Since we're focusing on the tree view in this project, let's try it out by manually setting some values and spending it. Great, now we have a basic tree view displayed. However, the current method will not achieve the Cupertino tree view style we ultimately want. So we'll use custom control to achieve this. For modular management, we'll create a new project specifically for custom control settings. The project type is custom control library and we will name it Cupertino support. Delete the automatically generated files and create a set of folders named UI and UNIS. Then we'll create a WPF custom control and call it Cupertino Tree View. We need to modify its inheritance to be from tree view. Okay, next, let's create a corresponding units folder in themes to manage the XAML files. As before, copy the style from generic file and rename it. Replace the using statements with units and update to the relevant parts below. Then let's go to generic file. Delete the unnecessary namespaces and use a merged dictionary to combine the projects. Confirm everything is correct. All right, now we need to add a reference to the newly created Cupertino support project. In the Cupertino window, add the unit's namespace from the support project. Replace original tree view with the Cupertino tree view. And set the font size. Since we recreated this tree view using custom control, we also need to refine the template. Right now, it doesn't have anything, so let's simply add a checkbox for testing. Okay, the custom control runs without any issue, right? Okay, next, let's generate some data in the view model to test. We will remove the original name property. To create a binding list, we need a model. We'll generate this model in the support project under local models. Create a new class called file item. And set it to public. We'll set it up simply. Then in the view model, create a public list of file item called files to generate the list. Next, let's implement binding in Cupertino window. Go to the tree view and set item source to bind to the files property. Now let's set up the files property in the view model. First, we'll create an empty list named the source. Then we're we'll added two new file item objects to this source list. Set the name property of the first file item to Vicky, and then copy it, and change the name to James. This way, the source list contains two file item objects, Vicky and James. Finally, we we'll assign the source list to the files property. Okay, let's run it. Uh, it's not showing up. Why isn't it showing up even through the binding is done? Currently, the tribute template has a checkbox, right? Here we should replace it 
with the items presenter. We've covered this part in the Smart Date and Magic Navigation Bar videos, remember? Alright, now the content is displayed. Next, we need to define the template for the items, right? So we'll create a Cupertino tree item. It will inherit from tree view item. For the demo part, we're copying an exit in fire, modify it, and integrate it into the generic file. And confirm everything is correct. Now in Cupertino tree item, we can add a text block to bind the name property we just said. Let's run it. Um, why isn't it showing anything changes? What's the reason? The Cupertino tree view still considers its children items as a tree view item. So we need to change this part. We can do this by overriding the get container for item override method. Although we can't see it, internally it works like this. So we need to return Cupertino trip item instead of trivial item. Let's run it again. Is the name showing up now? Of course, in our tree view, we need not only the name, but also path and size, right? So let's go to file item and add the path and size properties as well. In the view model, let's set the value for path and size. Finally, we also need to add the pass and size to the tree item. To make it easier, we can use the James grid provided by James Net WPF NuGet package for quick layout. Add the namespace and select a presentation. Now we can use it. Set rows to 1 and columns to 3, or set to auto. And we can also add some margin. OK, let's run it. Everything should display correctly. But we want the tree view have a hierarchy, right? with the folders and files. So to achieve this hierarchy, we need some real data. However, using data directly from the C drive is inconvenient due to the large amount and permission issues. So let's create some specific folders and files for testing. We'll create this part in support project. In the local folder, create a new folder called helps to manage the created data separately. We'll call it Fire Creator. Public Void Create. In this method, we'll create the files. First, let's set the file content. Then we'll define the folder path and specify the files and paths.
Using a for each loop will construct the full path. Check if the folder exists and create it if it doesn't. Finally, we write the content into the file. This way, our data is created. And we need to change the internal part to public for this class. Next, let's go back to the view model. We don't need the previous setup anymore. We'll call the new view model that we'll call the file creation method from the previous step and retrieve all the created file and folder information, storing it in the list. Create folders and files. Define the root path. And use get files to retrieve all the information. How do we retrieve it? Let's define that. For the folders, name will be the directory name without extension. Path will be the directory, and size will be set to null. For the files, name will be the same. And we'll get the size using file info. Finally, we we'll assign the retrieved information to the files property. All right, let's run it. Only Apple and Microsoft are displayed, but we want all the subfires to be shown as well. So what do we need here? A children's structure, right? First, let's go to file item and define the children property. Then back in the view model, since files are the lowest level of the structure, so we'll define children for the folders. In get files, we'll assign the directories and items to children. Okay, let's run it again. Um, even through children is added. Why isn't it displaying? Even though our trivial item is a children item, it also a parent item. We can verify this. Let's first see what the trivial inherits from. Oh, it's inherits from items control. Now let's see what the trivial item inherits from. It's inherits from hated items control. Well, we're not very familiar with this class, but we can dig deeper. We find that it's also inherits from items control. So trivial item is both a children item and a parent item. And this is why trivial can build such a hierarchical structure. So in this structure, trivial item can contain other items and also be an item itself, forming a complex tree structure. With this understanding, we need to change the UI. First, let's add a stack panel outside. Even with that, the child items are not showing up because we need to bind the child items to the item source. We're binding to children. Okay, let's run it. Now the child items are displayed, right? But we see the namespace again. We handled this part earlier, remember? We defined child items in Trivial. So we also need to define them in trivial item. The method is the same as before. Since we have defined child items in both trivial and trivial item, can we infer that this get container for item override method is provided by items control? Let's run it and see. 
all the data is displayed. This means the tribute is correctly bound. But there is a problem. The hierarchical relationship showing who is a parent and who is a child isn't reflected. Typically, we can adjust the left margin of each item to represent this hierarchy. To do this, we need a value that indicates the logical depths of each item. In the getFires method of the view model, we can add a depth property to calculate this value. First, let's declare int type depth variable and initialize it to zero. To allow the getFire method to receive this value, we need to add the parameter. We then assign the passed in depth value to the depth property of the file item folders and files. Since the getFire method is called recursively, we need to call the getFire method again for the child items within a folder, passing the current depth value. To increase the depth value for child items, we pass the current depth value plus 1. This way, the first child item steps will increase from 0 to 1, and the next child item steps will be 2. By doing this, we can accurately reflect the hierarchical depths of the tree structure, and the depth value allows us to easily visualize the depths and the position of the structure. Since the file item class doesn't yet have a depth property, so we need to add this int type depth property to the file item class. Now, for the trivial item, let's add another column and put the depths in the first column. Let's run it. Now the hierarchical is represented by depth value. From here, we can use a margin to show the physical position. But since margin is a thickness structure, we can't directly replace the depth number with a margin. So this is where using a converter is a great choice. Let's add a folder named converter and create a class called depth converter. First, define this class as public. To use this converter, we need to inherit from markup extension and iValue converter. Next, in provide value, we return the current instance. In convert, we change the volume to an int type depth. This step is necessary because the volume is a depth volume passed in, but its type is object, so we need to convert it to int. Then we we'll create a thickness instance called margin. Set the left volume of margin to depth multiplied by 20. Finally, return the margin. Now let's go back to the tree item. First, let's add a converter namespace. Then set a margin in the stack panel. We'll bind it to depths. This way we can use the converter. Since there is a lot of content, so we'll remove the font size setting. OK, let's run it. It might look a bit unnatural, but you can see the margin is showing the hierarchical. So next, let's make some specific adjustments. We can remove the desk part now. First, let's address the alignment issue. It looks odd because everything is set to auto. So let's change it. Set the first column to star, the second column to 300, and the third column to 100. Let's run it again. It looks better now, right? All right, the next step is to implement the collapse feature in the tree view. How can we achieve this? We can use the is expanded property of trivial item to hide or show the child node area. Trivial item provides a default board dependency property called is expanded. When you double click a trivial item, this property toggles between true and false. So we can use this internal mechanism to show the item's free center when is expanded is true and hide it when is expanded is false.
To control this state more intuitively, we can add a small checkbox or chevron toggle button in front. By binding the X check the property of this button to the is expanded property with a two-way binding, we can create a more powerful trivi control. Let's try using a checkbox first. First, add a clone at the beginning and set it to auto. Then we add a checkbox and set it is checked the property. We're binding the is check the property to is expanded property. Here we need to be careful. We can't use template binding because it's a one way binding. When the is check the value of checkbox or seven button changes, the is expanded value will not change. Therefore, we need to use a relative source for binding to achieve two way binding. Reset the margin to the same value. The visibility of items per center needs to be toggled, so we're giving it a next name. And set its initial visibility to collapsed. Now let's set up the is expanded trigger. When is expanded is true, the visibility of items per center should be set to visible. This will create the collapse and expand effect. Next, we'll replace the checkbox with the chevron button. To create this shape, we'll use a custom control. In the tree view folder, create a new custom control and call it chevron switch. And this control we'll inherit from toggle button. Then generate the corresponding XAML file, modify the using statements, and merge it into generic file. Let's confirm everything is set up correctly. OK, no issues. We'll delay the unnecessary content. First, let's add a geometry data for the expanded and collapsed states. Next, we'll add a pass, but since it requires multiple properties, so we'll create a style for it. We'll call it pass style. For the initial state, set the data property to Chevron DOM. Then set a next name to Chevron. Now we can define the triggers. When is checked is true, the button will switch to Chevron up. Then in tree item, replace the test checkbox with our Chevron switch. Let's run it. This is the effect we're looking for, right? However, we're facing an issue with the button not being responsive. We can fix this by adding a transparent background color. Now it works smoothly. Okay, next we can add some icons. But before that, we'll distinguish between folders and files using a type property. In tree view, we'll add another column. In file item, we'll add the type property as well. The type property is a data type will be a string, right? Then in the view model, we define folders as folder and files as file. Okay, let's try it. Now our files and folders are distinguished. Next, we'll replace the task with icons. We'll create a custom control for this. We'll name it fire icon. 
since we don't need the content here, so we'll just inherit from the country class. And then we'll generate the corresponding resource dictionary file. Modify the using statements and integrate it into generic file. Since these icons belong to different types, so we need to bind them based on their type. To achieve this, we'll create a dependency property, PROPDP. We'll name it type, since type is already in the, using the file item model. And we can set the default value to null. Okay, let's move on to file icon. We can use the X settings drag here and just modify the data. First, copy over the data for folders and files that we need. And we'll change the X name of the path to icon. Adjust the size to 16. And we can remove the initial state as it's not necessary. For the trigger, we'll use the type property we just created. When it's folder, we'll generate the folder geometry and set it a fill color for this shape. And when the type is fire, we'll generate the fire geometry. Then let's go back to tree item. We we'll replace the checkbox with file icon, and instead of text, we we'll use type here, right? Okay, let's run it and see. Great, the folders and files are displaying correctly. At this point, we got the basic structure of the tree view in place. Next, let's modify it to match the design we want. First, let's set some margin to center it a bit. Then we'll draw a border using the border brush and border thickness properties. Okay, perfect. At the very top, we should label the categories, name, path, and size. For the tree view, we'll use a grade for layout. Set two rows, one with auto, and the other with a star. Add three text block to include in these three categories. We should also draw the outer borderline here, right? However, text block doesn't have this line property. Since I want to use the border for design, so it's more appropriate to use a label here. Accordingly, change the text property to content. Now we can add a border brush and border thickness. Let's set the values uniformly to the right and button. Okay, let's take a look. Great, but the last one on the right side is duplicated, right? So we need to change the right side value to zero. Okay, perfect. Then we can add a bit of padding to make it look more natural. Let's take a closer look. The top and bottom areas don't align, right? This is because the grid in the tree view area and the grid in the item part have different layouts. So we need to make them consistent. First, in tree item, we initially used the James grid for convenience, but now we're switched to a basic grid for consistency. The first three parts go together, so we can add a stack panel inside of the grid. Set orientation to horizontal for automatic layout. 
And don't forget to mark the specific positions for the remaining controls. We need to set column definitions explicitly. So for the first column, we we'll use a star. And for the second and third columns, we we'll set them to auto and give them a minimal width. Then we'll use a shared size group to share this width across multiple grids, ensuring they align. Next, let's copy the grid column parts directly to the tree view. Finally, in the top level grid, set grid is shared size scope to true, so this grid and all its child elements can share the same width groups. Okay, let's take a look. The header and the content below are now consistent, right? Furthermore, we can add triggers like its mouse over and is selected. For the header, we can add a background color. Okay, perfect. Okay, let's move to the tree item. First, is selected. Here we also need to set a next name, so let's call it item. When selected, the background becomes to blue and the font color changes to white. The selected effect is not visible. But we cannot ignore the issue. The more we go to the child levels, the more space is left at the front and is not fully selectable. Why is that? And there are also some issues with the accuracy of selection when clicking. So let's set the background color first. Okay, let's analyze the current layout of the trivial item. First, we have a stack panel on the outer layer, which includes a grid and an item spray center. Inside of the grid, we have another stack panel setup. In the current state, we've applied the margin depth to the outer stack panel, which represents the entire area. What will be the effect when the depth is executed? The entire left side of this section will be affected, right? So in this state, when we execute the is selected trigger, which part gets selected? Since the front part is already occupied by the depths, it can only be this remaining part. So if we want to select an entire row, we shouldn't apply the margin to the outer stack panel, but only to the stack panel inside of the grid. This way, the depths will only affect the inner area. So in this state, when we execute the is select trigger, can we select the entire section? Of course we can. So we just need to add the margin property to the stack panel below. Okay, now we can select an entire row area. Okay, let's add a mouse over effect next. We can directly copy the code from above and modify it. Since the original color is already very light, so we don't need to change the font color. Um, there seems to be a problem with this mouse over effect. Why are both the parent and child levels being selected together? Let's take a look at the code. In WPF, the property of the trigger can only be used on the properties of the type specified by target type in the country template. In this case, it's trivial item. Therefore, the trigger will affect all property of trivial item, including its child element items presenter. So when we want to avoid the trigger affecting the child elements of trivial item, we should use data trigger here. By using element binding, we can specify a specific area, which is its a grid area, and then handle its mouse over. This way, it certainly won't affect items per center, right? Let's have a check. Okay, but we still need to set a background color to improve the click accuracy in this area. Additionally, when sliding to the is selected area, I don't want the mouse over effect to overlap, so we need to handle these two parts. First, the background should also exclude the item's presenter area, so we can add it to the grid area. For the second problem of overlapping, we can adjust the order of the two triggers. We can move is selected below is mouse over. Let's take a look. Okay, very good. 
All right, next step. In practical applications, we will encounter various file types, right? Here, I want different types have a different icons. How can we handle this? Actually, it's quite simple. Let's go to the view model. In the file class, add an extension property. With file info the extension, we can achieve this. We also need to add it to file item. Then go to file icon and create an extension dependency property. After that, we return to the resource section. First, add the specific data for the icons. And there we can define the specific extension. Once that's done, we go to tree item. We can bind the extension to the specific type. All right, after setting the specific icon types, the Chevron button in front of the fires doesn't need to be displayed anymore. So we need to set a trigger to distinguish between types. If the type of this part is a fire, we'll hide it. And here we can directly use the type property that we set up earlier. Here we are targeting the Chevron switch, so we need to add the next name. When the type is fired, we'll set the visibility to hidden or collapsed. Let's try hidden first. That is the effect that we want, right? And what about collapsed? Not only does the element disappear, but the layout space is also removed along with it. So the difference between hidden and collapsed is that when an element is hidden, it's not visible, but still occupies layout space. Whereas in collapsed, the element is not visible and doesn't occupy any layout space. You can choose based on your requirements. Here what we need is hidden. Okay, next we need to convert the file size into a readable format. For this, we'll use a converter. First, let's create a size converter. Here we need to change it to public because we are going to use binding. The class should inherit from markup extension and implement the iValue converter interface. In the override provide value method, we'll return this. Then we need to implement the converter method. Here we convert the size in bytes to a readable format like KB or MB. If the size is zero, we'll set it to this format. All right, next, let's go to tree item. For the size, we can add the size converter here. Great. With this, we've basically completed the main functionality. Finally, we want to implement the alternating row background effect, similar to what we see in the iOS system. To achieve this effect, the first method that comes to mind is to add a stack panel in the Trivial Items Presenter. Select 
Through a border, we can add a strap of a collar. Like this. If we want two collars, we can add another one. Then let's copy a few more sets. And the effect will come out right. Changing the colors makes it look very similar to the effect presented by iOS. Doesn't it? So if we use custom control method to build control like this, we can not only implement the template for trivial item that represents the hierarchical, but also flexibly implements various functions such as the item's percentage layout, header, and alternating background in the trivial country template. However, if I only want to display as much content as there is, how should I go about it? If we match the height of item's presenter content with the height of stack panel, wouldn't that work? So in items presenter, let's add a next name first. Then for the height of the stack panel, we use element binding to reflect the extra height. Next, we we'll set the vertical alignment of the items presenter to top. And we also need to set a vertical alignment of the stack panel to top. Okay, this way the background color will match the display range according to the extra content height, right? But there's still a problem here. We don't know exactly how many files there are. So setting up several border rows in advance like this doesn't seem very wise. So let's create a new control to set this part specifically. This actually highlights the superiority of custom controls. We can refine each step so we can enrich and adjust various details internally as needed at any time. This part doesn't require a template, so we can simply create a class, change it to public, and here we inherit the properties of stack panel. Let's quickly create a dependency property for height of type double and call it item height. It's for the magic step panel. Since the default value of item height is of a type double, so we can set it to 0, 0.0. Next, when the value of item height property changes, it needs to perform a cross background processing. So a corporate method is required. Therefore, let's create an item height property changed corporate event method. All right, firstly, the item height property changed corporate method for dependency property must be static because dependency property itself is static. Although it is actually used as an instance property, the core method must be static. Okay, next, to access magic stack panel in the item height property changed method, we need to convert the parameter D of type dependency object that is passed into magic stack panel type before performing operations. Next, we'll set a height of magic step panel to the value of the item height property. So the panel's height can be dynamically adjusted based on item height. Okay, finally, let's go to the tree view and replace the stack panel with magic step panel and replace the height with item height. Let's add a background color to test it. All right, the effect is here, and the background area increases with the specific height. What will happen if we didn't replace item height? Since we set the vertical alignment of stack panel to top, its height range is zero. Therefore, even if we set the background color to green, we won't be able to see this area at the wrong time. But if we set the height value of magic stack panel to item height, it can confirm the range of stack panel and display this area. Of course, in XAML, we can also directly bind the height to the actual height of items per center. However, here, in order to make it easier for everyone to understand this logic process, we handled it through the item height property changed curve method. All right, next, because we want to do a programmatic calculation based on the number of items, we first need to know the index. Here we can set the height of each item and then divide item height by the height of the item to get the specific index. Based on this index value, we can create the specific border controls. Let's set the height of the item to 36. The index will be equal to item height divided by 36. 
With this index value, we know how many border controls can be accommodated at the current height. Okay, next we need to create some border controls and add them to magic step panel. Create a new border with a height of 36. For the alternating background color, if i is an odd number, the background color will be green. And if it's an even number, it will be orange. This way, we'll have an alternating effect. Finally, we use children add to add the created border to the collection of children elements of magic star panel. Let's click again. When item height changes, the alternating background order of magic star panel becomes messed up. This phenomenon is actually because the selection of trivial item changes the actual height value of items per center in real time. After binding to item height property, item height will constantly change, causing the item height property changed carbon method to be cut frequently. Each time, it needs to generate the alternating background based on the new item height. In this process, if children value of magic star panel is not cleared, child elements will continuously accumulate, and the order will be messed up, resulting in a chaotic background. Okay, now the alternating background can be displayed correctly. For the color part, we can define two colors using solid color brush, and then we can directly add the colors we want using color converter. Let's call them color one and color two. Okay, for now we have completed the essential function implementation of this Cupertino style tree view. Next, we can further investigate how to get the value of tree view in a VVM model. For controls based on item controls, such as list box, we can usually handle the selected value by directly binding to selected item. However, because tree view has a parent child hierarchical structure, we can directly bind them like selected item. So when using tree view in the NVVN environment, we need to use the I command dependency property to implement this command. First, we need to create an I command type selection command dependency property in the tree view item custom control and implement the command to pass the selected value data context to the command. First, we're at the mouse left button of event in tree item. When the mouse is clicked, if the data context bound to the clicked UI elements is a fire item value, then we consider it as the selected attribute item. Next, let's verify through debugging whether this data context is bound to fire item. We click on Microsoft, and in the debugging window, we can see the properties of the current fire item. We see the name property shows Microsoft. Then we select Visual Studio. This time, we see it is set to Visual Studio. Press F5, and the event is called again, showing Microsoft. This is a reasonable result. This happens because it is triggered by mouse left button the event in tree item. Initially, we click on Visual Studio, which was recognized at first, but since Visual Studio is within the range of Microsoft and belongs to the parent items per center, the event was caught again. Actually, this is what we call bubbling events. When an event is triggered on child element, its parents element, including its answers elements, all have the opportunity to handle this event. In WPF, many UI elements and events have have a hierarchical structure, so they are affected by this hierarchical relationship. Therefore, when we handling events like mouse left button up or done, we must fully consider the characteristic of bubbling events before constructing our logic. 
In actual projects, we may encounter situations like this. I only click the ones. Why was it called multiple times? It happens because we haven't fully considered the events logic. Although not covered in this video, there are also alternately events. They are the opposite of bubbly events. Alternally elements start from the root elements and travel down the tree until they reach the point where the event originally occurred. So these two concepts should be distinguished in advance. There is a question. In events routing, which happens first? Is bubbling or tunneling? The answer is tunneling. The tunneling events complete first, and then the bubbling events occurs. Okay, back to our project. If we want to stop the event from propagating, we can set the e handout to true in the event handler, which will prevent the bubbling event from continuing. All right, let's check again. Click on Visual Studio, and here Visual Studio appears, and it stops here. Great. After confirming the data, to use it within the MVVM model, we'll create an I command type of property in tree item. We'll call it selection command. PROPTP. I command. Selection command. Okay, after creating the selection command, when selecting a tree item node, we can run it through the execute method. Since selection command might not be bound, we'll perform a null check to avoid exceptions. The item is a parameter we need to pass. All right, now let's go to tree item. The file item model in Cupertino tree item is already bound, right? In view model, we can directly access the command. To access the higher level view model, we can use relative source. So where is the nearest the data context? In Cupertino tree view, right? So in the past, we used data context, the selection command. This way, selection command can successfully bind to the command in the upper view model. Here, instead of directly creating I command, we use code auto generation feature provided by community toolkits to create a relay command. So to utilize this auto generation feature, we need to change the public class to partial. All right, next, let's create a relay command attribute since we've already created a selection command internally. So we can omit the commit part, but we must return the selection. This is a rule everyone knows, right? Okay, we pass file item we're executing in tree item, so we need to receive it back here. That's all. To test if the value is correctly received, we can create a string name inside of the method and debug it. No problem, right? TreeView itself doesn't provide command binding. So how do we utilize TreeView in MVVM? And how do we handle the data? I'm sure many of you have encountered similar issues. In this case, we construct a command internally and implement TreeView functionality by executing it. This video covers a lot of content. So I encourage everyone to study and understand this method thoroughly. And that is all for this episode of Cupertino Tree View Programming Tutorial. And I have already uploaded the source code of this project to GitHub. So while browsing and downloading, don't forget to click on the star and fork. We'll continue to update more high quality tutorials on WPF and other cross platform tech knowledge. So don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you next time. Bye bye.